Welcome everyone to UCLA Connections, where we have conversations that build community and foster resilience. I am Valerie Condos Field, the former head coach of the UCLA gymnastics team known as Miss Val. And I am extremely honored to be moderating our discussion today about the great legend that is Rafer Johnson. Joining me today are two Bruins that are from totally different generations and bring a totally different perspective of what Rafer Johnson meant to them. First, we have Damian Thomas. Damian is the museum curator of sport for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, which is the largest museum of African American culture in the world. Damian earned not only his undergraduate degree at UCLA, but also his master's and his PhD from UCLA in United States history. And I'm so thrilled to have him here. I've been speaking with him um, the last few days about Rafer and what he brings to the table is just fascinating. We also have with us Kaya McCullough. Kaya is the trifecta of UCLA Bruins. She was an extraordinary student, an academic student. She was one of our greatest UCLA soccer players in the last decade. And she went on to play professional soccer nationally for us, as well as in Germany. She also has recently come out as a resilient activist against racism. And I'm so thrilled to have you here with us, Kaya June McCullough. Damien, I'll start with you. How did Mr. Rafer Johnson's life and legacy as a UCLA alumnus most serve to promote true Bruin values and intersectionality in today's societal context? Well, I think if you look at Rafer Johnson and where he sit, sits as a, as a Olympian, as an activist, you really have to think about the role of sports in the United States. One of the things that's unique about the United States is how deeply sports are tied to our educational institution. And that's because we believe that sports have much wider implications. They reveal character, they teach about teamwork, about discipline, about hard work. They help build self-esteem. And Rayford Johnson is somebody who embodies those ideals. He didn't come to UCLA on an athletic scholarship. He came as an as an academic. And he not only set the world record in the decathlon, won a gold medal at the 1960 Olympics in the decathlon, he was also UCLA student body president in 1956. So in many ways, he represents all of the values that we associate with amateur sports. Thank you. And I love, I love listening to all of the history about Rayford Johnson and so much of it I think I knew because I was at UCLA for 37 years, but I know there is so much more um, to have learned about this incredible legend of ours. Kaya, how does Rafer Johnson's example help us use to help us rise to the challenge of carving out a new 21st century identity and enhance UCLA's social impact? Yeah, that's a that's a huge question, especially when we're talking about Rayford Johnson. He truly is or was a giant among men. And so kind of encapsulating everything that he was and everything he did is, did is tough. But I'll do my best here. Um, you know, I really when you look at his legacy, the thing that I take the most out of it is that he was arguably the greatest male athlete of his time at one point he was an incredible activist and pushed forward many social justice initiatives including the special olympics and you know lived through the civil rights movement and he had all of these gifts and all of this power and yet he still used it to help others and to love others Um, through everything that he was. And so I think, you know, as we're moving forward and we're facing issues that are similar to what he did in his time, um, you know, with the new racial reckoning that we're having after the murder of George Floyd, or even a lot of the implications of the COVID pandemic, um, 
I, what I really take from his legacy is his ability to use what he was given and use it to help others. Um, and I think that's something that we can all use in this time and place, um, especially as we're trying to carve out new ideals because loving each other is truly the way forward and having empathy as we're trying to face some of these social ills um, is going to be a really important part of moving forward and moving the ball forward. So that's really, you know, what I take from Rafer Johnson's legacy is, you know, he could have done anything again, greatest male athlete in the world at that time, he could have done anything. He could have just turned his head to what was happening around him, but instead he used his gift, um, to help others. So that's something that I really value and I'm trying to implement in my own activism in the 21st century. That's wonderful. I was, uh, Damien, would you sure. like to a Really good, good point. If we're gonna think about the lessons of, of Rayford Johnson for the 21st century, I think it's really important that we understand him also within the confines of the 20th century because that historical contextualization helps us understand our present moment. And one of the first ways we could do that is to think about who Rafer's role models were. And it happens to be a couple of UCLA guys, Jackie Robinson and Ralph Bunch, along with Jesse Owens, whose shadow in the world of Olympics is, is sort of vast. And these men came to prominence in the 1930s and the 1940s, where African-Americans were pursuing a particular um, vehicle towards racial advancement. And it's premised on this idea that African-Americans had to kind of demonstrate their capacity, demonstrate their ethics, their integrity. And in some ways they had to change hearts and minds. So the notion was that it was incumbent upon African-Americans to, to figure out how to kind of convince white America that they deserved full equality. What's interesting and part of the reasons why Rafer isn't often associated with that is that he comes at the tail end of that particular approach. And so African-Americans had been using that approach for the from the 1940s, 1950s with great success. And then Rafer Johnson becomes a preeminent figure in the late 1950s and the, the early 1960s where African-Americans began to question that approach. Because by that point, by the, by the early 60s or and mid 60s, African-Americans were half of the NBA, a third of the NFL, a quarter of the players in Major League Baseball. And people began to challenge whether that approach was still effective. And that's when you get the rise of some more, um, I guess, I, I would say them controversial and confrontational actually figures like Bill Russell, Jim Brown, and later another one, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So in many ways, Rafer Johnson is caught between these two generations and he's sort of in the middle um, between this, this fight about whether um, changing hearts and minds is the right approach or rather confrontation is the right approach to move the African-American struggle forward. So as we think about the 21st century, I think we've got a, Rafer provides an interesting place to think about which tactics are appropriate for the moment today. I think that's so important to discuss, especially Kaya, you are known for your activism. And I'd love for you to share with all of us how you came to be, who your parents are, and what Rafer meant to them. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I was quite literally born to be a Bruin, I think. My parents met at UCLA. They were both student athletes. Um, my dad was a football player, and my mom was a gymnast. Uh, first perfect 10, as you always like to remind me, and everybody likes to remind me at UCLA. Um, so, you know, I, I came from a legacy of Bruins and I wasn't expecting necessarily to go to UCLA. It was always kind of in the back of my head. But when I, you know, when it became a reality for me that I was going to be able to go to college for playing soccer, 
um, I was immediately drawn to UCLA and the, I still remember the first time I took my athletic, um, unofficial tour when I was like a sophomore in high school and being able to step on the campus for the first time in my own right and to be able to experience it as I might in my own journey was really powerful and I knew it was just the place for me. Even though I never personally met Rafer Johnson, I knew of his legacy through my parents. Um, my parents went to school with his kids and I even, you know, got to experience Jenny and her impact and working at UCLA within the athletic department and with my team. So being able to feel his power through others is, I think, you know, how his legacy has impacted me directly. Um, in preparation for this panel, my mom was telling me a story about talking with his wife, Betsy, um, about their interracial relationship. I am a biracial Black woman. And to know that, you know, before my mom had even started dating my dad, who was a Black man, um, that she was having these conversations that were very, very impactful on her and would be on her path forward, especially in having a biracial child. Um, kind of a, it's a surreal thought to me to kind of think that, you know, had that conversation not happened, had his experience as a person not influenced my parents' lives, like I might not even be here today. So in this weird kind of indirect way, I think Rafer's influence definitely you know, impacted my time as a Bruin, as a person, um, as a player, as an athlete, and now as an activist, it's, it's really hard to literally walk the same path that he did down Bruin walk. And it's hard to walk the path of all of these greats that came from UCLA, Jackie Robinson, um, and not feel the power that they left behind and not feel the, same desire to create change um, that they had. So um, his legacy is really powerful. And I feel like for me personally, again, I, I can only say it, it definitely drives my vision forward and, and gives me a path forward in all the work that I'm doing now. Wonderful. I think all of us that had the privilege of knowing Rafer, as I as I did <clears throat> know he was extremely humble. He was very funny. Um, he was gregarious, but he had that calm confidence um, combined with humility that was extremely attractive. And he married someone and Betsy just like that and their children are like that. And there's this whole Johnson clan that is making the world a better place. Damien, we have a question that came in asking, what do you think Rafer would consider to be his greatest accomplishment. And knowing him as I did, I would imagine that his response would be extremely humble. And so I would love to pair that question for you to what do you think Rafer's greatest accomplishment was? Sure. You know, I get a chance to, to spend some time with, with Rafer probably about about, man, it's, it's, I was about to say about three or four years ago, but it was actually about two years before the museum opened. So it was about seven years ago. And, and you know, one of the things that happened was that Carl Lewis donated his Olympic medals to the museum. And this was probably about three years before the museum opened. Most people weren't even aware of the museum. And I had this vision where I wanted to take Carl Lewis's medals and to place them on the wall and then next to them, I wanted to place the torch that Rafer Johnson used to light the Olympic flame. These, what better symbols of the Olympic movement are there than gold medals and, and a silver medal and also the Olympic torch. And so I reached out to him and I, and I went to meet with him. And one of the great pleasures of my job is I get to sit before people and to, to tell them why I want to preserve their history. And although I'm the sports curator, I don't think of our sports gallery as a hall of fame, but rather our sports gallery is designed to use sports as entry points to larger political, social, and cultural conversations to explain why sports matter and why they matter far beyond the playing field. 
So I got an opportunity to share with Rafer what I thought his legacy was and why it was important that our museum get the opportunity to share that legacy with the world. And so for me, I think Rafer's greatest accomplishment is that he helped define um, the potential of African-Americans for a generation. One of the things we have to remember was that in the 1950s, track and field was much more popular than it is now. You could, you could argue that it was the second most popular sport in the United States um, in the 19, mid, late 1950s behind boxing. And it's not so much later that, that football and basketball become more dominant. Certainly baseball was, was really big at this time. So he was a huge figure. And in many ways, he was a symbol of the possibilities of integration. And he was an African-American that, that both African-Americans and whites looked at as a symbol for what African-Americans could accomplish if they were given a fair chance to compete on terms of equality. Because that's, that's, that's what sports were for African-Americans, a metaphor for equality. And African-Americans use sports success and athletes like Rafer Johnson to say that if you open up the doors to law, if you open up the doors to, to medicine, to, to politics, we can do the same kind of things. And so he's a symbol of, of progress. Rafer, I think, would speak to his, his dedication to others. And, and I know the Special Olympics were dear to him. He's closely tied to the Kennedy family. He worked with Eunice Shriver to help create the Special Olympics. And he continued to work there um, well into his 80s. It was, it was something that was near and dear to him to teach the values and the model of sports to help build self-esteem and self-confidence to bring people together in, in friendship. I think was is what he would say would be his biggest biggest contribution. Um, a question for both of you, uh, Damian. I've heard you refer to Rafer as a bridge builder versus a fighter, and um, if you could speak to that a little bit. And then Kaya, I know that you are so excited to continue doing great work for our world before I think we started this, this uh, <laughs> before we hit record, we were all in agreement that you're gonna, the next generation is gonna go save the world. So how does that resonate with you, being an activist, being a bridge builder versus a fighter? And, and can a bridge builder accomplish the same things that someone that just goes out and fights for what they want? I think that's a really good, good question. Um, one is that as a bridge builder, what you try to do is work within the system to create opportunities for advancement. And sometimes people kind of crit critique that as being incremental, as it's being slow, as opposed to people who are confrontational, who are asking for much bigger transformative change right now. And so I think both approaches have been important for African-Americans and for other groups fighting for equality. And that's the thing about change is that you don't know when those moments are gonna be transformative or when you can eke out the best, um, the best you can at that particular moment. So it's important that you have people doing both. And, and there are times when that gradual path is gonna be more involved and there are times where that, contra that confrontational um, path is gonna be more involved and the best way forward. And one of the things that we begin to see is that people from both camps begin to criticize each other and to think that their way is the only way. And so I think it's important to remember that, that given the so social circumstances, what's possible changes. Sometimes you can push for everything, but then sometimes you gotta be willing to take those small steps knowing that you are contributing to progress. Just building off of that, I, I really do believe that there 
is the necessity for both. And in reflecting on Rafer's legacy, I definitely see that more clearly. I, I definitely would self-describe as somebody who is more of a foundation rocker more than a, a bridge builder. But, you know, you need both. And very clearly, both work. Um, again, looking back at Rafer and what he was able to accomplish, I think shows that bridge building can work. And um, yeah, just building off of what Damien said, you need both. I think there's value in both, especially as we're trying to confront these deeply, deeply interwoven issues beyond racial equality, beyond racial justice, um, the intersectionality of all these issues that we're trying to solve right now in this 21st century moment um, and their intersection with, you know, how our country was established, how it was founded, um, how it was woven with capitalism and white supremacy and homophobia and transphobia. There's so many issues to confront that in a lot of ways you need to attack it from both angles. And so I really do believe that there is space for both. There is the necessity for both. And it's great to have examples like Rafer Johnson to draw from um, in order to move forward. So Damien, when Rafer was um, running for student body president, do you have knowledge of what was in his mind when he was doing that? And was he looking at that as a way to, to affect the, the black community on campus? Or was he looking at that as being the bridge builder on campus? That's a question I never talked with him about. Yeah, I never got a chance to, to speak with him about that either. But you know, one of the one of the men that I mentioned earlier as a role model for him was, was another born, Ralph Bunch, who, um, who was the first African American to win the Nobel Peace Prize after he negotiated the peace settlement after uh, the Arab Israeli War in 1949. And Ralph Bunch was someone like Rayford Johnson, an, an incredible student. Um, a great athlete. Many people don't, don't realize Ralph Bunch was a basketball player at UCLA. He was also a basketball player there. And so I think if we look at his role models, that, that Rafer was someone who was a leader. You described him as charismatic and people gravitated to him. I wonder if whether it was Rafer Johnson's idea for him to run or if he was someone that people just sort of gravitated to and said that that this is a role we need you in. Even as he was um, a world record holder um, at the time, taking on those additional responsibilities as a student leader is just simply, a, simply an incredible accomplishment. Absolutely. Um, my, I was just so blessed to have a friendship with him and Betsy. Um, and as, as you're speaking about this amazing man and this legend, I keep giggling inside because every time I was with Rafer and we were with other people, I would want him to share his story. And I would ask him to talk about what it was like being in the Olympic games with CK Yang and the same coach, Ducky Drake, and how that happened and how they were both coached. And, and then Rafer, tell us about what it was like to wrestle the gun out of Sir Han Sirhan's hand. Um, is after he shot um, Robert Kennedy and Rafer was so humble and there was a goofy side to him. I know someone who's with us today just wrote in and just said how thrilled he is that we're doing this. And it is Phil, Philip Goldberg and Philip, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Philip helped Rafer write his book and it is a fabulous compliment to what we're talking about today. I encourage all of you to go out and read this and, and get it and study Rafer. With that being said, Kaya, as a young generational activist, okay, I'm sure you're here, sick of hearing me say that. How important is it to you to lead the charge in not just keeping Rafer's memory alive and Jackie Robinson's May for uh, memory life and Ralph Bunches and Coach Woodens and Jackie Joyner Kersey's and all these people that have come before us. But if it's important to you, how do you plan on doing that? <laughs> big question. A big question. Um, yeah, no, it's very important. And I think, you know, I can speak for myself that a lot of what I do, I feel very blessed and empowered um, 
through my ancestors and the people who came before me and the legacies that they wrote and their stories that they they had and again I kind of believe in this um, duty to move the ball forward not only for future generations not only for our generation but for the generations that sacrificed and toiled and struggled before us to get us to where we are now and to give us the ability to you know sit here on this panel and speak to people um so it is something that is deeply important to me personally and more as just like this grander idea but in terms of how I intend to do it again I intend to move the ball forward I think the best homage to their legacy is moving it forward and continuing it and not letting their work that they did um, go in vain. I think it is our duty as people, especially as a black woman, as a young black woman to continue the legacy of the people that came before me. And so, you know, exactly how I am going to do that. I don't have all the cards for that yet. I'm continuing to become educated. I'm applying for law school. I am speaking out about the issues that I care about and the issues that they cared about. And I'm continuing to speak up and use the voice and use the platform that they prepped for me. They set the groundwork for my ability to speak now and to speak here and to speak to others. So I think the best way that I can honor them um, and the best way a lot of us can honor them is to just continue their work um, in their image and with their intentions and, you know, just making sure that we are all pushing for a better tomorrow for everybody, um, which sounds really, really cliche, but it's the truth. And I, I mentioned it in the beginning, like I, I feel very divinely guided by the people who came before me and I know that they're surrounding me as I do this work and as we all do this work. So wonderful. When I, I do a lot of speaking with younger um, students, student athletes, and I love to bring up Rafer Johnson because they don't know who Rafer Johnson is. And I will show them the book and I'll give them some examples of who Rafer was. And then very simply and in a very elementary style, I describe Rafer Johnson to them as a human. And as I'm speaking, usually to, to young athletes, and I will say, you know, a great athlete is someone who works really hard, that doesn't skimp on conditioning, that eats well, rests well, does everything they need to do to be a great athlete. The difference between a great athlete and a champion is a champion does all those things that a great athlete does but the champion includes those around him or her, or includes their teammates to help make them as good as he is. And Rafer Johnson was not just a great athlete, he was a champion. And then those are those champions, those few that take it to a whole other level of superhero. And superheroes, when you think of superheroes, superheroes lift all of us up along the, the way. And on their path, while they're, they're reaching and striving for greatness and achievements that are way beyond their, their wildest dreams, they're actually doing that by lifting us all up along the way. And you can see that, the illustration of that, what I see is what he did with the Special Olympics in lifting so many people up. So Rayford Johnson, in my opinion, is not just a great athlete. He's not just a champion, but he truly is a superhero. And Damien, I'm going to give you the last question here. Um, how do you feel as a historian that we, not just UCLA, Bruin Nation, but that we as a society can best honor and, and keep vital um, the legacy of people like Rafer Johnson, who truly changed history? I think it is important that that we learn from them that we see both their accomplishments the setback the struggle one of the things that's important to acknowledge is that Rafer Johnson was was heavily criticized by athletes later in the 1960s because they saw his mode of protest as being being outdated 
but Rafer remained committed that this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is the path that I believe um, that I can take. Even while he admired people like Tommy Smith and John Carlos. And part of it is, is the ultimate lesson is that you gotta be true to your convictions and who you are and what you believe matters. And I think that's the lesson of Rafer Johnson and, and all of the other athletes that have, have made a, a transformative um, change in society. Thank you. And thank you for tapping into UCLA Connections, conversations with past connections. If you would like to see anything in the past, or if you would like to revisit this thrilling conversation that we've just had, please type into ucla.edu slash connections. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.